Tonight's episode of Fireside is brought to you by Legends of Belize. Visit legendsofbelize.com to learn more. Hello, everybody. You're listening to Fireside Paranormal Podcast. My name is Jordan Klein. I have a great show planned out for you today. My guest tonight is Danger Will Robinson. Before we get to him, just a few announcements. Newsly is an audio app for iOS and Android. It picks up web articles about the most trending topics on the web at any given moment and reads them to you in a natural human voice. For the first time in the history of the internet, the entire web becomes listenable. Browse articles from topics you choose and start playing. Stop scrolling, start listening. You can follow any topic as specific as you'd like, from sports, science, to Bitcoin, or even the Kardashians. It'll find you the latest articles and read them to you aloud. They also have podcasts, so explore trending podcasts from over 50 countries. My show, Fireside Paranormal Podcast, is there too. Download and use Newsly for free now from www.newsly.me or from the link in the description and use promo code FIRESIDE where the eyes are ones. I'll also put that in the description and you receive one month free premium subscription. I also want to give a shout out to our new patron. Danielle Flanagan. Thank you so much for joining the the Patreon. I appreciate you. Thank you for supporting the show. If anyone out there wants to check it out, it is patreon.com slash fireside paranormal. Lots of fun stuff that can be had. Lots of bonus audio, giveaways, merch. Tier levels start at just a dollar. American Paranormal Magazine is also giving out their Owly Award. If you go to paranormalzine.com, you can vote on your favorite paranormal person of the year i would appreciate it if you put my name in uh it is paranormalzine.com and while you're on the site check out some of their issues you might see something that you like are you into the paranormal true ghost stories bigfoot and alien encounters or high strangeness and conspiracies well if so then you should check out my podcast called somewhere in dreamland my name is ken mark and every week i interview authors researchers and experiencers alike in the fields of the paranormal cryptozoology ufology and spirituality so why not take a dive down that rabbit hole with me and search for somewhere in dreamland wherever you listen to podcasts that's somewhere in dreamland Okay, let's get into our featured stories. Our first is going to be a group highlight, Three Souls Paranormal. My name is Stephen Nolte. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Our group is Three Souls Paranormal. We're based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The group consists of myself, Stephen, um, Frank Seary, Mark Kastner, and my wife, Emily Nolte. My personal story is I have two of them. Um, They have to deal with um, family-related passings. Okay. Um, 1995, my sister passed away. From a boating accident and um it was a rough time for all of us you know and one night i'm sleeping in my bedroom and my sister comes in my bedroom literally like full figure everything like and i'm like melissa you're dead like you can't be here so you talk to her yes and i'm like she was like next time you see me i'm taking you with me and that's that was it she was gone after that I was 15 years old when this happened. Oh, man. That's how my first paranormal experience ever started, and I've been into it ever since, me seeing my sister passing away. Now, are you into it because you want to see her again? No, not right now. I don't want to see her right now. I'm into it because there's so what's out there. Like, I don't know what's out there. Like, that's why we do this, to get answers so we can show people what could be out there. Yeah. And it's... It's an adrenaline rush for me. Like, I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of a lot of things. But but I ain't afraid of no ghosts. Right. Be, <laughs> being locked down in a building with lights out, one of the most ex- exonerating things ever. Like, just hearing that little noise, you're like, oh, just like, just catching your attention and your heart starts pumping and you want more and more. It's it's like a drug. Yeah. And um, my second paranormal experience with my family is my dad just passed away June 28th. And, um... Very unexpected, but July 5th and 6th, right every time I'd close my eyes and go to sleep, he would say, Hello, can you hear me? Oh, and really? that was his voice. 
And I'm like, Dad, yes, I can hear you, but I don't know where you're at. But on the 7th and 8th of July, he said, please help me. Oh. Yeah. And I'm like, how do you want me to help you? Like, I can't help you. So I ended up making a video of me trying to communicate with my dad on YouTube. It's on our YouTube channel, uh, Three Souls Paranormal. And it was the most heartbreaking thing I've ever had to do. And um, I told him he had to go be with his mom and dad, you know, pretty yeah. much. And sorry, uh, sorry, but um, that was like the hardest thing I've had to do for somebody, you know. I bet. But that was my personal experience with my family. Um, but our first investigation was down here at Moundsville as a team. It was me, Frank, and my wife, um, Friday the 13th, 2014, back in June. Oh, June's wow. Friday the 13th. And um, me and Frank, w and we was up on um, the J Block. What was that cell? The cell name? Billy the Kid Cell. Like, it, it was weird. But we're sitting there doing us, um EVP session. We are <sighs> like, like this growl or whatever it was. And we're like, did you hear that? And my wife is down <laughs> around the... My wife is down around the range. She took off. She came running back to us like, did you hear that voice? Like, she heard it, like, 200 feet away from us. And that was here at Moundsville. That was pretty awesome. But we was at the Conjuring House um, up in Harrisville, Rhode Island. Corey and Jen, the previous owners, were super awesome. Um, now, do you have these videos on YouTube? Yes, we do have. And it's Three Souls Paranormal. Yes, on YouTube. Um, we're on Instagram, Facebook. Um, he just started a TikTok channel for us. Nice. So we're all on social media. Um, but we was at the Con Drink House. But a personal experience from ours as a group, we was at um, a high reformatory up on the um, second floor of solitary confinement. And um, I think he, you're videoing a little bit, right, Frank? You're videoing on your phone. You see the, all the orbs and everything flying through the yeah. camera. So our REM pods are down on the solitary confinement, and they're going off. And they're making this hissing noise, too, while they're going off. So I'm like, okay, maybe our battery's dying. Let me take it off. Turn it off. Take the battery out. The rim part starts going off in my hand Ooh. with no battery in it. It shouldn't even have been on. It starts going off. And then, yeah, Frank, you want to tell them what happened there with you? Something followed me home that day. <laughs> <laughs> Something followed him home. <laughs> I got it out, though. It's out of the house. But, yeah, I was sitting there. So my wife just left. To go to grocery shop, and I'm sitting in my recliner watching TV, watching TV, and then all of a sudden I hear, "Hey," right out of the blue, like I'm talking to you right now. Oh man! Hey, you know, and I felt my hair go up in the back of my neck, and I'm stand up and I'm looking around, I'm like, "Oh shit, I'm the only one here," <laughs> <laughs> you know. But uh, I had to get stern with it to get it to leave the house. I tried being nice the first time, didn't work. So didn't happen. Second time. Had to be a little sterner, and it, it's gone. So I'm glad of that. Good deal. Hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> hey, Thank you're you, welcome. Sir. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Thanks, guys. Our next story comes from one of our younger listeners, Damien. Damien Dawson from West Virginia, New Martinsville. And um, we're talking about the New Orleans Cemetery Ghost Tour. Okay. So my mom went on a, my mom went on a ghost tour and. New Orleans, Louisiana, and it was in a cemetery, and she's like seen like a couple of ghosts in in the um, cemetery, and I got a photo here. You got photos of it? I got one. It has you can see the pants, and no like body part. How about that? Then, then um, when she went home, she has like a haunted hotel about like kind of like. She, it, like it was like a orphanage, I think it was. Then um, the orphanage burned down. It switched it over into a hotel. Then um, there used to be a nun in the orphanage that hanged uh -huh. herself, and and there was like kids in the orphanage, like haunted kids. My mom has experience with one. Like they were asleep in my dad's bracelet was kind of moving forward and backwards. Oh, wow. And also, they were... Wasn't there toilet paper everywhere? And then, then there was toilet paper everywhere? She took a picture where, like, the nun, like, room, 
then um the next night she had like a bad nightmare of the nun in her face and like a little girl and she was started to burn oh wow well, thank you buddy You're welcome. thank you damien up next jeff my name is jeffrey goodrich uh go by jeff i'm less in trouble uh, I am from Nelsonville, Ohio, uh, near the beautiful Hocking Hills. I grew up in Elyria, which is kind of where the story kind of takes place. Uh, so when I was a kid, uh, we lived in the house, and the house had a lot of really, really weird things kind of going on, uh, to the point of, at one point, there was a bit of a tiny little apparition that a lot of times we just kind of chalked up to the fact that I had lost a, uh, a very young cousin, to Sid's, um, sitting on the edge of the bed. And it was funny because that one always had a tendency to kind of comfort us, and didn't really know exactly why we, we had that, that ability to kind of comfort us until a little bit later on. I was uh, about 12 or 13 years old. We were playing in the basement. We had one of those little jungle gyms that was like kind of the green, blue, Tyco jungle gyms and stuff. Me and my brother were down there. We're just playing volleyball, uh, just kind of throwing it over, hitting it over and everything. Uh, at one point, I'm still hitting the ball over, and uh, I decided to tell my brother that I'm about to go upstairs. He's not answering me, but the ball's still coming back. Uh, when I went over there to kind of just tell him I was going upstairs because he wasn't responding. I was getting a little frustrated, you know, older brother stuff. Uh, he wasn't there, so I don't know who I was playing with. Uh, we chalked it up to Charlie the Angels, what we used to call him, uh, just so we didn't get freaked out over it. Um, that kind of started to kind of spiral everything from there. Uh, from there on, uh, I ran upstairs. My mom freaked out. Uh, I yelled at my brother because I was frustrated. Uh, he had been up there apparently eating grilled cheese sandwiches and ice cream uh, for, for a short time. Um, and then from there, everything just kind of started to happen. Uh, we had a rocking horse uh, that started kind of moving on its own. Again, told my mom about it. She come downstairs, stops the rocking horse. And um, again, more just like deep kind of rumbly sounds coming from it. Not like a growl, but just, uh, just, just weird. Not something that comes from a plastic rocking horse. And uh, she ended up stopping the rocking horse. It started back up. Um, we got the house staged. Uh, that didn't seem to do anything. Uh, eventually, a Catholic priest actually came out to the house. Uh, bless the house and uh, even then some of the stuff didn't really stop um, uh, he picked out several different items that he thought maybe could have like some sort of weird attachment to it uh, we burned them moved the rocking horse which uh, was no longer going to be a, a staple of the family you know heirlooms here and uh, moved that out to the uh, to the side so it could be picked up by garbage and uh, after that stuff started to kind of settle down eventually we ended up moving it was just kind of a kind of a bad experience but um, it ended up ended up pretty intense, pretty amazing. Made me a believer for sure. So, and thank you, Jeff. If you would like your story to be one of our featured stories, make sure you send me an email: firesideparanormalpodcast at gmail dot com. If you don't want to record your voice, I know some people are a little shy with that. You can type it out, and we can read it for you. Legends of Belize is a series about mythical creatures that dwell in the jungles and waters of Belize. The Belizean legends are captured, documented, and preserved like never before in a comprehensive art series and books with fully colored and detailed images of fine art by artists, authors, and award-winning animators Dismas and Grissy G. Discover the supernatural creatures that await deep in the jungles, such as the mysterious dwarf called Tata Duende with backwards feet known to rip the thumbs off of trespassers or the beautiful shape-shifting woman known to locals as the Ishtabai, who seduces drunks to never be seen again. These creatures and many more can be found in the Legends of Belize books. Learn about the cryptozoological, paranormal, and unexplained creatures that haunt Belize. Be fascinated. Be terrified. Belize. The Legends of Belize books are available in print and ebook. Buy your copy from your favorite online bookstore such as Amazon, KDP, Apple Books, and many more. Also, be sure to visit legendsofbelize.com. All right, I want to get to my guest. Join me by the fire as we welcome Danger Will Robinson. He is a writer. He does folklore, all kinds of fun stuff. Will, are you with us? I am with you. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining me this week. Hey, thanks for having me. So here's what's funny, right? Will, can I call you Will instead of Danger, or do you want Danger? You can call me Will. <laughs> uh, you live not in West Virginia, correct? Correct. Now, where do, where do you live at? You don't have to be I specific. South, South Portland, Maine. Portland, Maine. And you love West Virginia folklore. Oh, I do. Very much so. How did that even come about? Uh, 2002, I was living in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I saw the Mothman Prophecies oh. movie. And I bought the book in the same mall right after the movie was over 
and it took about a week to read it. And it's by far the scariest book I've ever read. The weird stuff happened when I read it, but it was later on in life when I took the job I have, I've had for 15 years inspecting housing and I got the West Virginia territory. So for about five years, I would travel the entire state inspecting uh, affordable housing program. And so I've seen every, I've seen a lot of West Virginia that most tourists probably don't see. And then of course, once I was doing a job in Point Pleasant, mm. uh, the little kid in me got so excited <laughs> and I didn't know there was a Mothman museum. I did not know there was a Mothman statue. So the minute we pull in and I see those two things, I told my coworker, we're having lunch here. Uh, it's gonna take about two hours. And I spent an hour and a half in the museum and I probably spent $250. Oh. And I talked to the owner for probably an hour and a half. Jeff? Yeah. Yes. Did you go into the TNT area at all? Yes. This was probably five or six years ago. I know they moved recently, but about five or six years ago. And he was just in heaven that I walked in knowing what I knew. And I just keep piling stuff on the counter. Everybody I know got a shirt or a mug or a sticker. <laughs> and no one was surprised when I came back with all the Mothman stuff because I would talk about it all the time. Right. Everybody loves Mothman. Would you say Mothman's your favorite cryptid? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I know about, you know, like the grafted monster and, um, uh, green buyer, green briar ghost. Uh, what's that? The sheep Is that one? Is that correct? There's a, there's a lot. Like there's a lot. There's so many there. of them. Oh, and bat boy. Yeah. Oh, like weekly bat world bat news. Boy. You got to throw that in there. Yeah. I, uh, I thought I knew bat boy from a kid, but I'm 53 and I looked it up and they didn't report him until 1992. So I thought I knew about him in the seventies and eighties. Who knows? Hey, well, maybe you had an experience. Maybe you right? did. Now, you were traveling to West Virginia for to inspect houses, but you, you were coming from New England area down? Yeah, flying in, like fly from Portland to D.C., D.C. to uh, Charleston. All right, so you would have loved uh, with the conventions. I've been doing conventions, and uh, I made a lot of uh, merchandise that had Mothman on it. Oh, and nice. You, you would not believe how fast all that went. People love oh, I'm sure. Mothman. You know, and I mean, the movie itself was good. I don't think people realize that's one tiny story in a much scarier book. Hands down. He's like a minor character. Yeah. It just, I mean, when I was reading that book, the, the weirdest stuff was happening to me that even my housemate, who's still my housemate, was just like, when you're done with that book, will you just throw it away or something? Because <laughs> I'm getting tired of this stuff. I mean, the phone would ring and it'd be all static on it. We had some weird storm move in one day where the clouds are so low. It's like you could touch them from the porch. Oh, wow. I was on a beach one day reading it. Before I pulled it out of the bag, some woman randomly said to her friend, have you seen that movie, The Mothman Prophecies? And that her friend said, what are you talking about? She's like, I, I don't I don't know where that came from. And I had my hand on the book in the bag. And I looked at my housemate, Russ, and he said, throw it away when you get home. So I finished <laughs> the book and I threw it away right when I got home. It is it is a crazy book, and a lot of folks don't know. Like, you think of the Mothman, it's just Mothman. But, man, what John Keel wrote about, like, just on the river, like, there were UFOs dancing around, and people would, like, gather around with picnics and watch the UFOs dipping around the the, the water. Like, there were big deal. men in black, like, some crazy men in black sightings. Oh, I mean, they, they scare me a lot, too. Now, I tried to read a book on the men in black and it might uh, be, I can't remember his name, but the opening sentence says, if you're reading this book, they already know you exist. And I threw the book away. <laughs> I'm like I'm not messing with that. <laughs> and I've been to men in black for Halloween two, two times. Yeah. Well, well it, you know, the Will Smith men in black. What's uh, really crazy. Um, I was down in point pleasant and you know, the, the diner, that in the book where all the men in black were, where they were making comments about how they were eating crazy and right. you know, making the weird comments and they were bringing people in and, and interviewing them. Uh, you know, that diner, the lady was, is a big part of the community. She's passed away since then. But, um, you know, I got to go to that diner and actually sit down and talk with her. It was an empty day and we got to hang out with her for like an hour. She was telling us all kinds of stories about it. Uh, she invited us to an event in the town right after it was uh, me and my mom. I took my mom down. It was pretty neat. Is your mom a believer? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. We yeah, did the, the TNT all the area. We did all kinds of stuff. Recently. Say it again? How, all the different places. Like, he's been sighted all over Chicago for the last, like, five years. Yeah, I'm actually going to be. Some of the stories people tell are just, I'm like, that's him. If you didn't know about him before, what you just described was him. Yeah, there's uh, 
people posting pictures of things all the time. Chicago is a big area right now for it. Yeah. So I lived in central Illinois when I was a little kid. I was born there. And we moved away when I was eight. And a few months after we moved, my cousins started sending me articles about these giant birds that literally are picking children up off the ground. What? And carrying them like a like 50 yards. I looked it up a few weeks ago to make sure that I didn't make this up in my head at eight years old, but there are still stories out there that a uh, town over from where I grew up that this woman and her kid were in the yard, this big bird thing swooped down and picked him up and carried him away and then dropped him. He survived, but these giant cryptid birds are being seen around central Illinois. And I was like, why do we move so soon? If I stayed five more months, I could have seen this. I could have got stolen. <laughs> Mom, carried away. You know? Now, would they be Thunderbirds, or do you think that's Mothman? I don't know. I mean, they almost kind of sound like condors, like just because the wingspan was so huge, and you know, it only lasted a few months. So, did they? Was it like Jeepers Creepers? It came up. It's twenty three years happened, and there he is. <laughs> I don't know, but that was some crazy stuff. I I wish I'd kept the articles because my cousins were so excited about it. That's neat. I didn't know about that. Now, you, uh, we talked before, and I I know you're a writer right you you write do you write about your experiences i know you write poetry and short stories and things like that what where do you get your inspiration for that um i don't always know i often tell people that i think as writers were conduits kind of and sometimes i'm also a really strong empath so i feel like a lot of what i write might be coming from someone else and i'm just the the writer that gets this one you know i get to write this down but i do write i'm i'm really uh, raw in writing about my own past trauma and such. Uh, and I have a blog and I, I discuss a lot of really hard things to talk about because I want to make sure that if someone else is going through what I went through, they can see someone else has been through it. And I'm just really frank about what my healing process has been. And, you know, a lot of great art comes from pain and I didn't live an easy life. I have a great life now. Growing up was not easy. And so to channel any or all of that pain into writing is I mean, it's as important therapy to me as my therapist is. Wow. But the short stories and stuff, I don't know where that stuff comes from. The, the Orphan of Appalachia, the one I said in West Virginia, I just wanted to contribute to the folklore there. And I was just racking my brain how to do it, trying to figure out. I have no idea where I dreamed up uh, Mother Mia in that story. I, I don't know where she came from, but I'm so glad she showed up. Do you want to share a little bit, like uh, talk about what that story is about? So the story is set in Duck, West Virginia, which is next to Strange, West Virginia. And the story about Strange is that it was settled by um, a camp of people, and I think it was a cook named William Strange. And this is a true story. Um, he, him and his dog disappeared. And they were, in a, I think years later, his skeleton and the dog's skeleton, perfectly formed, were sitting under a, a, it was a chestnut tree. Oh, and he wow. carved a poem in the tree that said, Strange is my name. Strange is the ground. Strange is something that I can't be found. So I thought, oh, there's something. I'll start there. And so I knew I was going to start there and end there. And it turns out this guy named Tom Strain is a teacher in Duck, West Virginia, because he got into some trouble in Charleston. And he just hates his job. He's teaching these kids who are all, you know, descendants of the people who worked in the coal mines. And so their parents are all dying of black lung disease. And a lot of the kids, you know, we don't know if the parents are even alive at home because they don't talk you know, to the, the teachers and stuff. It's like the uh, the movie Antlers, the short story that's based on, where what happens, I, I reference that in this story very yeah. very keenly. I reference, like, people have learned you don't go visiting these, these uh, households out in the woods, you know, because feral dogs and stuff like that. And so what happens is there's this one kid in his class who anytime he engages this kid in a conversation, he starts, it just thunders and lightnings and rains, and he starts to smell this sweet smell. And uh, the kid tries everything to get the teacher not to pay attention to him. And this kid lives by himself out in the woods. Um, his mother died a few years ago. He's still collecting the checks. And he's learned to be self-sufficient. There's a great part in the story where it describes what his, his daily life is like in this house with no plumbing and no lights and how he collects firewood and how he gets food. And anytime somebody gets close to the house, though, there's a thunder lightning. And it turns out that um, there's this ghost of a, an old Irish witch who years ago, um, some settlers came in and killed all the adults in the, in the settlement and left the kids. So this woman, this witch, taught all these children how to be self-sufficient. 
after, of course, killing all the people who, you know, killed the parents. And so over the years, well, obviously. she protected all the orphans of Appalachia. But it's, I have her origin story. I even, like, research some Gaelic spells. I researched so many maps of West Virginia to make sure that every last step those characters took existed somewhere in that area. All the roads, you know, the music, everything, the climate. What, could it rain and storm that time of year there? Yes, it could. So it was, I probably... It's a 23 page story printed out. I, I probably spent a good 15 to 20 hours researching it. Wow. Now, are, are you going to uh, uh, turn that into a novel or anything like that? It sounds like a great story. You know, I, um, I've i tried to submit it to uh, different places, but a 23 page story isn't a short story. It's not a novella. It's a 23 page story. So, you know, I've, I've kind of just, you know, I was talking to Kristen, Paranorm Girl, about it. She was like, you're going to flush it out into a screenplay or a book. And I said, do you know how much it took to write 23 pages? I mean, most of my stories are between like eight and 10. <laughs> and uh, I had a, a friend of mine who's an English teacher. She helped a lot with editing. Um, but it, I think it's about the creme de la creme of what I've written. And uh, every now and then I'll read it and I'm like, oh, yeah, I wrote this. You're like, and well, it listen, 23 out. pages is all you're getting from me. Don't try. Yeah, yeah, Keep it up. It's funny because 23 is my favorite number, and it's a 23-page story. There it is. Yeah. I uh, won't give too much away about the character of Tom, but um, at the end, I'll, I'll give people a link if they want to go read it. I have a couple other stories up there. The most recent one was pretty much commissioned by Kristen. That one's called Forever 8. It's a seven-minute short story, so it's read out loud at seven minutes. And I've posted it for people to read, and people have literally said, I can't believe that was only seven minutes. I can't believe I know this much about two people in seven <laughs> minutes and about what happened. <laughs> hey, sometimes it's magic like that, right? Yeah. Now this is all on your blog, and, and yes. how can what what is your blog? Well, um, as we talked earlier, my my name is actually Will Whalen, but my husband's last name is Robinson, so I always go by Will Robinson. But the blog is my full name dot com. It's William B. Waylon, that's whale with an N, W H A L E N dot com. And everything's there. So we're going to be saying that again here at the end, too, to make sure that everybody gets that. Um, awesome. Now, let's get into some of your experiences because not only, not only have you had like haunted house type experiences, you've also experienced UFOs as well. I so have. I actually photographed one, I showed that to you. All right. So let's talk about the UFOs first. Uh, the first UFO I saw was in Arizona. I lived in the middle of the desert, no light pollution. It's probably 77, 1977. My grandmother, who uh, from Illinois in her 70s, spent her whole life on a farm. So her and I are sitting in my driveway, and we see this strange light just shoot up over the horizon. Of course, I'm eight or nine years old. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's so cool. It starts doing weird things in the sky. And my grandmother's kind of just looking into her lap. I'm like, Grandma, look, you got to see this. Finally, she looks up, and she's and she's kind of shaking her head. And we lived a couple hours north of an Air Force base, so it wasn't uncommon for us to see jets flying around. But I know what jets look like when they fly. This was not a jet. And it just, I was fascinated by it, but I could tell my grandmother was not. So then it got higher up in the sky, but never closer to us. And the way it moved, it definitely had a trajectory but nothing I'd ever seen it, you know, my long seven years on the planet, but even not since have I seen something move like that. And I was in the army and I used to fly in Blackhawks and all that good stuff. And so then we saw these two jets come up over the horizon and chase it. And then it looked like they got close to it. And to me, it looked like it shot off into space because it just went, it was like, boom. And it just kind of disappeared. And then the jets looked oh, wow. around and went back south. So I looked at my grandma and I said, what was that? She goes, you think I would have learned from my life on the farm? You don't look up at the sky at night. And that was the last thing she said about it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> not... So she was a farm woman in Illinois. There's lots of UFO activity in Illinois. So Is there really? She and then the second one was um, just last spring, the one I showed you a photograph of. I was, I'd been uh, studying about the Pleiadian star cluster and the supposed race of beings that live there. And so I went out on my deck because there was a big ring around the sun in the afternoon and I wanted to take a picture of it. And I was standing out there and I saw this white light just start kind of moving into my frame, a vision, and then it kind of stopped. 
and then it, it went up really quickly. And then it, it was just, it didn't make sense. I was just staring at it like, what in the hell is that? And it got right close to the ring of the sun. I'm like, oh, I have a phone. So I pulled my phone really quick and took a picture, put it down as it passed the ring around the sun. Kind of did the same thing where it got, it got a little bigger and brighter and almost like it went directly away from me and it was gone. And I've enlarged that picture, you know, so you can get a look at it. And it's, there's definitely something there. You know, I have people telling me it's a sun dog. I said, no, it's not, because that's a flare. I, I saw it move in the sky before I photographed it. And I've shown that picture to quite a few people and everyone's just kind of shaking their head like, I don't know, dude, you caught something. And the third one was about a month ago. Uh, we real went. quick, real quick. I do want to add that you're probably one of the very few people that see a paranormal you know, of some kind experience going on and you think to grab your phone. Oh, I'm surprised. I Every, everybody else is like, yeah, I saw it. Did you have your phone? Uh-uh. Did you take a picture? No. Mm -mm, nope. Because you don't think about it. That's yeah. not what's, when you're so, it's like watching a tornado. That's why people die in tornadoes. Like, that's so cool. <laughs> there you go. You know, you don't think to take a picture or run away. But the other one, a couple weekends ago, we were, my husband and I and our housemate were laying on the deck looking at satellites and pointing them out because there's so many up there now. And even where we are, there's a, enough light pollution that, and trees around us that we don't have a huge uh, view of the sky, but it was pretty awesome that night. It was a new moon and there were so many satellites up there. I mean, we were just like, there's one, there's one, there's one. And my housemate and I were, my husband was across the deck from us. So we had a, a different vision of the sky. And Russ goes, what's that? And we're watching this thing, this light move across the sky. It wasn't a satellite, closer than a satellite, further away than a plane moving in a way it shouldn't be moving. Then it got really, really bright and then disappeared. And uh, my housemate, Russ, is a skeptic, beyond a skeptic. He's a science guy. I mean, he believes there's life out there like most rational people do. But we both believe we saw something that probably was not of this earth. And we really don't think it was a, it wasn't a meteor or comet. There's no tail. It also had a trajectory and it seemed to have control over the way it moved. And that one, you know, even if I had my phone, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to pick it up at night. So when you say that it moved not like a plane, what, what do you mean? What did, what did it do? You know, we live near the airport. There's a plane flying over me right now. So we see planes fly over all the time. We see them late at night, during the day. And, you know, planes just kind of, kind of like, well, satellites have that really smooth, kind of moving fast. You know, planes have all the blinking lights on them, and you can always tell it's an airplane. This was a ball of light that like seemed like, I don't know, it's like maybe it was trying to disguise itself as something else because the way the light, the light on it didn't look like a star, didn't like anything I'd ever seen or he'd ever seen. And just the way it was kind of moving in the sky with a trajectory that it's hard to explain because it was kind of going at an angle, almost like it was arcing out in a curve. And then it kind of started going the other way when it, it was going straight, like again, away from us. That's when it got really, really, really bright. And then the last thing we saw was a big flash that disappeared. Wow. Like gone, disappeared. Like it got much bigger and then gone. Like the light on your screen behind you is how big it looked to us before it disappeared. And before that, it was like, you know, the size of a dime, if not smaller. Oh, uh, so it, it, there was definitely an increase. Yeah, there was something going on. All right. So for those of you listening, it's the reflection of my porch light on the TV behind me. It's and not a UFO reflecting in the sky. Probably the size of, ah, I'm a big guy. I'm going to say like a dinner plate. There you go. Yeah. Started as a dime and ended <laughs> as a dinner plate. And then it disappeared. Man, that's incredible. Now, you were researching a race of extraterrestrial. Is that what you said? Uh, yes. Uh, for back, lack of a better word, uh, the Palladian race, they're thought to be um, very energy based beings, very harmonious, peaceful, um, and they have the ability or the opportunity that they can spend a lifetime on Earth as a human. But the problem is they go there without the knowledge of the, that they're a Palladian. And really? they got to, because a friend of mine, had, when, and then while they're here, they're called star seeds. So what happens is for people much like myself, and I'm not saying I believe I'm a star seed, but Things where you, if you, one of those people who never felt like you fit in, like on earth, period. Like, I just always felt like I understand things that other people don't, even as a little kid. So many basic things on this earth do not make sense to me. 
I'll never understand racism, how you could dislike a person because of the color of their skin. I don't understand hatred. I don't understand how people enjoy misery. I don't, I don't understand these basic things in life. I don't understand how um, awful people get into power and then preach hate and preach violence. I don't get why humans believe this. Like, why would you follow the word of someone else? I don't idolize anybody. I don't put people on pedestals. You know, I don't, if my favorite pop star does something wrong, I've written them off before. My politicians disappoint me. I won't vote for you again. I just, I, I just, I feel like sometimes not in a condescending way that I'm kind of looking down on what's happening. Like I don't understand it. And so in researching that, like, oh, you could be a star seed or, you know, I could just be in a, it could be a past life and I've evolved a little bit more. Um, but the idea that that vast universe has so many different races out there, I'm sure. But the idea that they can come here for all just our souls are just our energy that once it leaves his body, it can pretty much go anywhere it wants when you think about it. Yeah. But it's always inherently us. So for star seeds, they're saying that your subconscious is still remembering your values and ideas from wherever you your soul originated. It's saying that not all souls originate in the Christian heaven. Some souls originate in different galaxies and different places like that. And they travel around and, you know, and they pick my mom and dad and here I am, I guess. That was going to be my next question. Like, how how does that work with being born? Well, I guess the same way it would, the way Christians believe that, you know, at some point, I think they call it the guth, the hall of souls, where the soul at some point enters the, the body of the, you know, the fetus at some point. A, a Christian soul would probably come from the guth. And I think for whatever reason, I don't know who chooses what soul ends up in, you know, what baby, but if the opportunity arose that, you know, maybe they get to, maybe it's a lottery system or something. They sign up for it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to earth. I'm going to be born in Illinois. It's going to be great. And then I call back, Ooh, I got stuck in a Catholic family. This will be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, you, I was an alien. Yeah. I, well, I was. And I'm now I'm Mormon, you know? <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, growing up Catholic, the funniest thing to me was every story I was told, I'm like, well, that sounds like a spaceship. Some big glowing chariot came down from the sky and this thing came down with wings and a thousand eyes. Hmm. And then we look at all the drawings on the, in the pyramids and all the caves. And I'm like, you know, there have been spaceships drawn since men could draw. And, you know, part of me just it makes so much sense to me. But, you know, I come from a very Catholic family and I, I try not to upset them with my ideas. Well, I always say, who's to say, you know, and I have family members, too, that will say, well, I mean, and this is the Christian outlook, you know, if Jesus died for our sins it would be in the bible if he died you know anyone else but would it have to be written down i mean it's kind of that is information that's like two thousand years old and per pertinent to us like here right who's to say that there wasn't some other thing that was pertinent to another galaxy another world you know but like you said i think as large and vast as the universe not not just the yeah you know how but big it galaxy. is they've already you know found all these planets that could withhold life you know, right. And who's to say that these other beings need air and water like we do? You know, they're saying, oh, we couldn't have it Mars. We couldn't breathe there. Well, we can't. But we can't breathe underwater either. There's a whole lot of fish who can. That's, a, that's like, you know, us in the U.S. going to like, I don't know, Canada. And they're like, they don't have real money up there. We use money in America. <laughs> and they're, you know, it's what? It's just, it's just different. It's like that cartoon with the two fish are in the water and one says, it was crazy, man. I was swimming along and all of a sudden, like, I got yanked out of the water and I'm in this vessel and this guy's poking at me and stuff. Then I'm just back here. And the other fish is like, you're crazy, man. That didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, fish get abducted all the time. Oh, yeah. For sport. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's talk about some of your ghosty experiences. Oh, my, my favorite is... Uh, an apartment, my first, second apartment here in Portland, Maine. I moved in with a female roommate. Nothing happened. It's a building from the 1800s, um, an odd building. Like the stairway going up the middle at one point was open air because there is a covered window in our, a window in our bathroom that opens up to a brick wall. So we heard that it was a boarding house for years when it was first built, but we know what it was for. So my female roommate moved out and my friend Brian moved in and the second day he was there, I was at work. He called me and he said, there's someone in the apartment. I uh -oh. said, well, what are we talking about? He goes, 
I can hear them walking around outside my bedroom door. I said, well, dude, you're, you're like a big muscle dude. Go figure it out. He goes, I'm not going out there. I was like, well, I can't come home from work. So I got home from work later. And this guy was in his closet with a baseball bat. And I walked in, I unlocked the door and walked in, walked to the apartment. I'm like, Brian, there's nobody here. He's like, I'm not crazy. I'm like, well, I mean, kind of all speaks for itself, right? And then him and I were in his room playing something on the computer. And this is like 1998. Yeah, 1998, 1999. And we have a closet, uh, hallway closet door that is really heavy and sticks. And literally you have to put a foot against the wall to open it every time. And uh, that thing flew wide open. Ooh. And we walk out in the hall, look at it. I look at him and I'm like, oh my God, what the hell was that? And it just kept progressing. It was um, things would come on in the middle of the night. Lamps would go on and off. And we're like, maybe it's wiring. Okay, well, why is that lamp vibrating? Like these things just kept happening over and over again. One time, really? 10 of our friends witnessed this floor lamp just start violently shaking and stop. And our TV popped on and turned off. And they're like, we got to get out of here. I'm like, well, we just don't really know what's going on, but this is what it is. We start talking to other people in the building and anyone who had a, a female um, occupant in their apartment, nothing happened there. And we found out much later that that was a boarding house for women who came up here with their, their husbands when they went out to sea. So they would oh, stay wow. in this apartment, a boarding house. And if their husbands didn't return, a lot of them just grew old and died there. Oh, so wow. we're pretty sure it was a woman because she was quite, seemed quite upset when the woman moved out of our apartment. But we just kind of ended up making peace with it. Like, okay, well, you know, this is it. And every now and then, like, you know, you could pay rent. And it was just such a <laughs> common thing for us. And the two guys who lived in the first floor would call us and be like, something happened in your apartment right now? I'm like, yeah, she's roaming around. She's knocking stuff off the shelves. And it just, it, it never scared us, except the one time the stereo came on in the middle of the night. We all came flying out expecting to see a ghost. So we never saw an apparition or anything, but uh, yeah, she was there. And there were times when you'd get that cold sensation when you go over, you know, like, oh, she just walked through me. That was nice. It was nice. <laughs> yeah, it was nice of her. It was a little hot here anyway. And then I lived on, what was the, other, the one in Chicago. When I lived in Chicago, that was a freaky our apartment itself wasn't the worst one, but the woman in the basement would come out of her apartment screaming quite often. And I was in her apartment one time, sitting in a chair, and there's a, a, a big mirror leaning against the wall to my side. So I was watching her make coffee in the kitchen. And then I just glanced at the mirror, and I saw this big black mass behind me. Oh. And the breath I took was like, <gasps> right? And I bolted out her door. Then she came running out after me and she's like, what? I'm like, you didn't see that thing behind me? And she goes, no, but I've seen it many times. I'm like, I don't know how you live here. I couldn't do this. And in our apartment, we had two giant pocket doors that while well, watching TV when I, they just slammed closed. And we're talking, they're like eight, probably eight foot by eight foot pocket doors. This building's from the 1800s as well. So just big, slammed big closed. Doors. And you had to pull on them just to get them out of their, you know, the pocket. And they just slammed closed. And I was... I turned to my boyfriend at the time, like, oh man, that that just happened, right? And he's like, oh, it did. And he's like, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to stop shaking. And then it'd be weird things would come out in the morning and the kitchen cabinets would be open and just little weird things like that. And we never had a sense of what was haunting that place, but, you know, Chicago's got its own sorted history. Who knows who lived there and died there? Right. And how many serial killers have come out of that area? I know. Um, now, this was it a black mass figure like what it was almost like a you know like what a swarm of birds looks like in the sky okay, yeah like it was kind of like that like it wasn't all one thing but i mean i i glanced it in the mirror and did not look behind me and ran out of that room as fast out of that apartment as fast as i could but i've had other friends in maine who've had haunted apartments you just be over there and weird things would happen and you know maine's another place i mean this state is just chock full of haunted everything. We have haunted roads. We have haunted towns. Haunted roads? Yeah. There's one. It's far enough away that I haven't ventured out there, but I don't have much of a desire to drive down a haunted road in the middle of the night. Because, you know, then it happens to me. It's like, well, well you came here. What What, what, what constitutes that? a haunted road? Is that like uh, you got the girl on the side that you pick up as a hitchhiker kind of haunted road or? Like you're just driving that and this, down They just the see hell. different apparitions on these roads. I think there's like two of them that I know of. I can't think of their names now, but there's um, two where people just won't drive down those at night. Like they're not roads you would travel down unless you sought them out. So it's not like it's highway, you know, it's not like it's I-95. 
Not a big road. No. So what well, are we the... have a notorious haunted cemetery here that I went out to one night, and of course, absolutely nothing happened. What are, what's the tales from that? What's the, um, what's I think the lore? It's called the Anderson Cemetery. It's in Wyndham, Maine. It's just been known as like the most haunted cemetery in Maine, and you know we go out there for three hours on fall night, nothing happens. But one of the premier ghost hunters, paranormal investigators in uh, Portland or Maine, Chris, I can't think of his last name, he showed up. Wow. And he came out to talk to us. He's like, you guys see anything, anything out here tonight? I'm like, nothing at all. He goes, this can be a hot bed of activity. He goes, I've been out here a few times. I took some pictures where it was a little foggy too, where people think they can see like an image in the fog. I was like, yeah, but you know how light reflects off fog. You're never going to know. And then I don't know if I sent you those photos a while back of the cemetery in Cape Cod. We went into a cemetery in Cape Cod. I don't think it being Friday the 13th has much to do I with it. I think you it did. Happened. Is that where it, had, it was very misty and foggy in different areas? And there's like finger things coming at us. And that was because that was so strange because I had I have an Android phone and my housemate or our friend there had an iPhone. We got into that family plot that we decided to investigate. My phone went berserk and died as oh. I started to take a photo. Her phone stayed on. And we got all those pictures from her phone. And there literally, it looks like these, like that thing from uh, the abyss, kind of like a snaky kind of thing coming, yeah. like for them coming at us. There's a few of the photos where it, it always looks like they're reaching for us. And it wasn't foggy that night. That's the crazy thing. It, there wasn't a lot of moisture in the air that night. So when we looked at those, because my phone came back on right after we got out of the cemetery, my phone came back on. And then hers had been on the whole time. And you know, we just went back to the house and we kind of looked at the pictures and we thought they were all messed up. So we just put, we looked at it in the morning, attached it to a computer. I'm like, oh my God, that's crazy. Like, I mean, literally those things are reaching for us. I've had a lot of uh, paranormal investigators look at those like, you know what? I got to tell you, there's something there. I mean, there's definitely something there. Have you ever been back? No, um, we're going to Cape Cod for Christmas this year. We're thinking about stopping there on the way. It's a little far from our destination, but now we found out a friend of ours' parents live there. So when he gets back in country, we're going to go down and check it out at night again. Yeah. But it was on this one family plot, and it turned out to be the guy who invented the paper bag. <laughs> He's also a famous ship captain, too. Really? Yeah. Now, I'm I'm really curious to hear what what happens, you know, on the second investigation if you get anything else like that, especially if it's a known pretty active location. Um, I know that one family plot was cuz we walked around for about 20 minutes before we stopped at that one. I think the last name was Cromwell. Um, but we stopped at that one and we all of a sudden all the hair starts standing up on our arms like, "Oh my god, this is so cool, you guys. Already you can tell us something here." And of course, when my phone died, it was a, the picture that was taken as my phone died has all these really weird, crazy red and green lines through it. And you can see the top of the family monument. Oh, wow. And then, and then the rest are from the iPhone. I know people are going, this makes iPhones better than Androids. Well, so I agree. Saying, oh, so the iPhone worked <laughs> in the cemetery with the ghost, but not the Android. I was going to say it's either haunted or just usual for an Android. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But even like our, we're at our friend's grandparents' house, they have a house there in the Cape, and uh, one of the girls would have called her grandmother the next day and asked her about it. She goes, oh, we don't go in that cemetery at night. Why would you do that? Everyone knows it's haunted. I'm like, how did you grow up on Cape Cod in the summers not knowing not to come into the cemetery? Right. There's a lot of history there. A lot of history. Okay. Well, New England history is, I mean, it's I mean, it's the birth of our country, birthplace of our country. It's so. some intense history. Yeah. There's a cemetery down the street from my house. Um, it's pretty old. I don't think people are still getting buried there. It's a creepy cemetery, but I've been there at night before, you know, we lost our dog last year. I would take him there all the time at night because he could just run around, but he would never pee or poop in that cemetery, which I thought was quite respectful, but he just Agreed. never did. I always tried to make sure he did that before we got into the cemetery, but you know, anywhere else I would take him, you know, he'd pee and poop every five steps in the cemetery. He never did it. And he would like walk up to different gravestones and kind of sniff them around and kind of back up and walk around. But I photographed it at night. I've never caught even, you know, an orb there. But Do you think I'm that the dog back. saw anything? He seemed to like, he seemed interested in different gravesites at times. Um, like he'd just walk right up to him, just look at him like, hmm, 
wonder what this is. Well, there's 500 around you. Why are you looking at this one? But yeah, I mean, he was, he was a pretty intuitive dog as well. But he loved that cemetery. But it was just always crazy that he was just always so well behaved in there. And never peed or pooped on anything, which every other dog did. So you had the only respectful pooch. I guess so. Now you would could you... probably hear the ghost saying, don't you do that. Don't you do that. <laughs> Get on out of here right now. <laughs> would you consider yourself an investigator at all? Uh, not really, because I've not done many active investigations. I've just been lucky enough to encounter them different times. Like, you know, we just thought it'd be fun to go to the cemetery see if we'd capture anything. Um, you know, I just got lucky, I guess, to live in two haunted apartments. Um, it just, it's always just been around me. I've just always, things have always kind of happened around me. And, you know, being an empath too, I think it opens me up a little more, but I've never actually gotten into, and I went to one overnight investigation that I was like, okay, they just wanted my money. <laughs> That's all. Um, but no, I'm not, I'm more of an enthusiast. Um, but I'm also, I'm very rational, realistic, and I'm a skeptic. I don't believe right away. Oh my God, that was a ghost. I run through everything it could be besides that before I start. Okay. I can't explain that one. Like the, the UFO we saw a month ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that was. I don't think it came from earth, but I can't tell you what it was. I know that two of us saw it plain as day. Yeah. It, and the one I sent you, I mean, you can't explain that one away. Here's, here's an interesting thought. And, and I've been asking this to a few folks. Um, all right. So I had somebody bring it up to me that a lot of folks in the paranormal are also contactees. Oh, that, that would make sense. I think something draws us to it because not everyone's drawn to it. You know, I think when we're drawn to it, it kind of reminds me of that Men in Black book. If you're reading this, they're already aware of you. So if we're drawn to it, I think that, that the spirit will, they're aware of us. Mm. And so I think it's how open that paranormal person is, you know, the enthusiast to what they want to receive and what they want to see. Um, but I think to go into any of this, even if you believe you're a contactee or you're, you know, you're touched in a way that they're going to reach out, um, you still have to, you have to go into it with an open mind and just, you know, be smart and be, be skeptical about it. And uh, a, another person, um, this is Joe Montaldo. He runs ICAR, the International Community for Alien Research, uh, that if you see a UFO, it's because you've been taken before and you were allowed to see them. See, so how does that make you feel? I'm okay with that one because when I was a very small child in Illinois, before we owned a TV, before I had ever seen or heard of aliens, I had a dream that my parents, I came down the stairs and they were sitting on the couch and there was a gray alien sitting between them with the big almond eyes. Really? Uh, yeah, I was about four. And I got halfway downstairs and I looked at them and I went right, right back upstairs and went to bed. And I was probably four years old. And I've, I've often wondered, I don't think that every person who is abducted or has been taken has been probed and tortured. No, no. That, I think that I, everyone always talks about the fact that other than like the trauma I experienced growing up, a lot of bad things don't really happen to me. Like I've never broken a bone. I should have broken probably all of them based on what a rough and tumble kid I was. I've never had surgery. Um, I've never spent a night in a hospital. I survived a war. I'm a combat veteran. I survived a war. I was about I've to been, add that one in there. Yeah. I've been in two different car accidents that I shouldn't have survived. And I always chalk it up to my guardian spirit, but you know, who knows? And I asked this one organization one time I found online. I'm like, is it possible that maybe, or maybe it's being a star seed. That's why I'm connected. Maybe I'm seeing my home family ships or whatever, you know, I mean, who knows what it is, but could be. You know, they can come get me anytime at this point. I want to just gather a certain amount of people. Like, can we just get out of here until we can fix stuff down here? <laughs> Good luck with that. I know. Maybe you're here to fix it, Will. I'm trying. I really am. Now, uh, let everybody know where to find you again. Your blog, are you online, social media? So, social media, both of my accounts. Um, my, I don't really use Facebook much at all, uh, other than to promote my blog. Instagram, it's Danger Will Robinson, 1L and Will. Um, right now, it's set it private because it kind of started blowing up with a lot of negative people kind of coming at me and 
being an empath, I have a, I can't deal with the comment section online. It just triggers me and I want to go off on everybody. I just can't do it. And so I'm about to set it back to public again. I'll probably do that tomorrow. Set it back to public. Um, and then anybody can follow me there if they want. My Instagram's kind of all over the board. It's just me and my life here in Maine. Um, like I, I, you know, I had COVID last week. So there were some COVID posts about how much fun that was. Um, but my blog is where I really laid on the line. It's, it's all there. There are no secrets. I talk about really difficult things that, you know, for years I couldn't even like acknowledge happened to me. Um, but by the grace of good therapy and good friends and a great husband and everything, I've been able to come to terms with all these things that have happened to me. And I, if I can use my talent of writing and the power of writing to speak to other people and maybe help people feel less alone, that's really important to me. I, I, I enjoy being a good person. I think my job is to treat others well and you know, help people find their own light because I found mine. You know, well, I will say that that is the number one thing that made me want to have you on the show. Not necessarily your paranormal experiences, which are a plus because that's what the show is about, but it, about the healing and mental health. And I'm going to give a, a hats off to another uh, show out there called uh, Middle Aged and Creeped Out. You know, those guys focus every episode on something as far as men's uh, mental health because it's something that doesn't stand out and uh you know we all need you know i, I think uh don't want to get into too much you know with things but you know as far as men there's a lot of stuff going on as far as mental health that doesn't get recognized and there's a battle out there that a lot of folks are facing so and i feel but, like we've only been talking about mental health in men for a few years and you look at all these men who you know dealt with sexual abuse as a child or, you know, combat veterans and all this PTSD that people think you don't get PTSD from something like war, but no, PTSD is so common. I think so many people don't realize they suffer from it and it affects your mental health. Like I spent years thinking I had to fix every single person I met and that talk about draining. I mean, that just takes everything out of you. You just got to learn to pick and choose, but you know, if I can help one person heal, then, you know, I've done my job as a human. I've had people reach out to me because I talk about sexual abuse that I've dealt with and things like that. And I'm very honest and frank about it. And, you know, there's one where I tell people, you know, I, I'm going to call it what it is. It's rape because we try to give them these nice little words because when we talk about it happening to men, it's not supposed to happen to men, you know, but it happens to a lot more men than the men want to express. And, you know, I'm not trying to do this champion for men thing, but as a man who's dealt with a lot of, severe trauma and mental health. I understand how important it is to find your light and find your healing. And I feel like that is one of my jobs on this planet is to help others. Like I said, find their light and find their healing. And, you know, I, 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 I'm flattered that that's why you wanted me on the show. It's nice that people recognize it. Yeah. Can you give your blog uh, address one more time? Yes. It's William, the letter B and then Waylon, W H A L E N.com. Danger. Will Robinson. Thank That's you me. so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you. I love the stories. And, uh, you know, we're going to keep in contact. Yes. Oh, I'm so happy you had me. I was so excited when you first reached out. I went to Kristen right away. I'm like, hey, is this good? Is this good? She's like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Jordan reached out. You're going to have so much fun. <laughs> so you, you, once you got the, the you know, the her praises, I knew I knew you were good people. Wow. That, that, that means a lot. Thank you. She's a great person. Yes, she is. All right. Well, that is all our time. Thank you so much, Will. Oh, thank you for having me. What a, what a great time. And with that, the fire is out. Thank you so much, Will, for coming on the show. And thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate y'all. If you haven't had the chance to connect with me on social media, make sure you check out Fireside Paranormal Hub on Facebook. Check out our Instagram, Twitter, at Fireside Parapod, and TikTok. Check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash firesideparanormal, and go to firesideparanormal.com where you can get your sweet, sweet Fireside merch. That is all the time we have for this week. Until next week, everybody, don't be afraid, only believe. <laughs>